I'm pleased to introduce the chairman and CEO of MicroStrategy and also the trustee of the Sailor Academy, who as noted in your program, uh, really knows firsthand the freedom and opportunity that debt-free education can provide. Uh, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Michael Saylor. Thank you, Jeff. It's a delight to see you all this morning, maybe this afternoon. No, still this morning for 60 seconds. Made it just in time. Um, <clears throat> Jeff asked me to, uh, to share a few thoughts on the credentialing economy and especially developments in, in industry and the way employers are thinking about uh, credentials and recruiting and, uh, and jobs and the types of, uh, of jobs that are being formed in the modern economy right now. Um, my, uh, my day job is I run MicroStrategy, which is an enterprise software company. And we have about 5,000 enterprise customers all around the world. So last year, I circled the world about six times. And I, you know, I was in Tokyo, and I was in Beijing, and Hangzhou, and I was in Paris, and London, and Chicago, and New York, and San Francisco. And everywhere I go, I meet with um, about a dozen large enterprises, so companies like it might be Facebook or Amazon or Citigroup or Emirates Airlines or Toyota. Uh, they make cars, they're media companies, they're governments. And um, I always ask them, what is on your agenda in the coming year? And, uh, and it, it gives you a broad-based uh, feel for what's on the minds of most industries and most, uh, and most employers. And I, I guess I start with... Um, the big picture. Um, if you look at the technology firmament, the mobile wave and the cloud wave are, are driving an extraordinary avalanche of digital transformation. And the mobile wave really, in essence, means everybody's got a smartphone in their pocket, and that's a computer. And on that computer, I can place any piece of software, nearly friction-free. Uh, Apple just announced that uh, they got about a billion iOS devices. And just last week, they announced that their newest uh, iOS operating system shipped to half of those devices in two weeks. So, you know, if you, if you look at the stock market, when the mobile wave was written, right, uh, in 2011, 2010, we talked about the implications of a world where Google and Apple and Facebook and Amazon could put their software on everybody's phone and change the way people make decisions. Uh, since then, uh, those four companies have emerged as four of the five most valuable companies on the face of the earth. Um, all of the cynics and all the critics think, oh, well, this doesn't make any sense. I mean, Apple can't be the most valuable company on earth. There's never been a company as valuable as this. It's a dangerous thing to buy the stock. Um, what they miss out on is the observation that there's, the reason Apple's the most valuable company in the world is because it's the company in the world most capable of creating value. And there's never been a company in the history of the world that could create value as rapidly as Apple. And that statistic is the great example, which is in two weeks, I could ship a new product or a new service to 500 million people with a variable cost of nearly zero. And there's never in the history of the world been a company that could ship a product to 500 million people for zero and do it in two weeks. In fact, there's never been, been an example of a company that could ship a product to 50 million people. And if you roll the clock back 20 years, you couldn't have shipped the product to 10 million people. So we live in a... In a, a incredible new world where you can ship products and services to hundreds of millions of people very rapidly. And of course, the big obvious beneficiaries have been the Googles and the Facebooks and the Apples and the Amazons. But they're simply the most visible indicator of a trend. And the trend is toward, uh, is toward the dematerialization of all products and all services to the extent they can be de dematerialized. And we're all familiar with camera dematerialized. But of course, <coughs> 
you know, if I take my, my watch, my Apple Watch 3, third time's a charm, normally the first time's a toy, the second time doesn't quite work, third time starts to work, this is the truth with many things in life, that's why the English language idiom, third time's a charm, uh, the third iPhone started to work, the third Apple Watch is starting to work, when I double tap this, I get my credit card. And, uh, you know, a, a watch is a crappy interface for building spreadsheets, and it's actually a crappy interface for looking at spreadsheets. But it's a pretty good, uh, it's a pretty good device for holding a digital token or a digital credential. This happens to be a digital credential. It's a, it's a financial identity. Um, it could be a political identity. It could be a student identity. It, it you know, it could be my scuba license, you know? It's like I... Well, on the subject of credentials, I, I still have this little soft spot in my heart because 18 years ago, I learned to scuba dive and they actually, anybody scuba dive in the audience? Yeah, some people. You know, you get your little NAWI certification and you gotta have this card and if you ever wanna go to any resort anywhere else and go scuba dive and they wanna see the card. So I went through the scuba diving class and then I was all excited and they gave me this paperwork and they said, well, you have to mail this in to this registrar and they'll send you a card. And I got the paperwork and then I put it somewhere and then I lost it and I never mailed it in. And uh, so now every single time I go to a resort anywhere, they always ask me for this card and I always think, oh, now I can't scuba dive anymore. And it really makes me irritated. But, it's, but I can't help but think gosh, if we lived in a modern network world, I could have got my certificate issued. Maybe they could have put it on a blockchain, by the way, and then it would be sitting in a, in a trusted, verified environment, and I would never have to worry about losing that stinking card, which has been the scourge of my existence. I'm, it's like one of the things I'm embarrassed about. You ever lose something and you're really irritated that you lost it? Well, so I lost that one thing, and it, I carry it with me. But um, back to this issue, right? So. I got a wearable device, it's got a credential on it, I can use it to buy a coffee. What's going on in the economy? Well, lots of profound things are going on in the economy. Like number one thing is, is Apple a bank? And what's the relationship? Because, because this is a Visa credit card issued from Bank of America sitting on my wrist. But it turns out that there's a company that can actually rewrite the way that credit card works and ship it to 500 million people and do it over the weekend. And that's a pretty profound thing. Now, a lot of people have noticed that, and that's driving the digital transformation wave. So every enterprise on earth is thinking, what's your digital strategy? <clears throat> um, media companies need a digital strategy. Uh, you know, and and uh, we see it, for example, and it's, there are good aspects of it and bad aspects of it. Like, like, for example, when you look at your news feed, yeah, the, the other, when I look at my news feed, Facebook or Twitter, or whatever, they try to figure out what I'm going to react to and they actually spoon feed me based on my biases. And uh, it's a really great monetization strategy. They make a lot of money. But I actually find myself now enjoying looking at a physical newspaper because the newspaper doesn't know what I want to read and I might discover something and an unbiased, some, like I see stuff in the newspaper that never comes to me via Facebook or Instagram or Twitter because it doesn't know who I am. And so this idea of edit, edited content or, or a, a flat, unbiased news feed, you know, is, a, is an old idea made new again, right? It might be regulated back into the digital marketplace. I am, you know, I can't help but think though that uh, this is having a, a big impact on a lot of people. I, I meet with healthcare companies, and healthcare, they're thinking about uh, how do I implement predictive algorithms to figure out who to let out of the hospital and who's going to recover and what the treatment ought to be. Uh, in the area of insurance, it's also, it's also a lot of intelligence. Uh, in the area of banking, in the area of, of uh, retail, in the area of manufacturing, uh, there's a demand for two skill sets that are exploding. Uh, one, computer science. Uh, and we want developers. We want to hire, you know, everybody's hiring a host of developers. 
Uh, how do I uh, put a thousand developers into my insurance company and have them all start to build custom applications to react to regulatory requirements or to seize market opportunity or to put a, um, a mobile app into the hands of my consumers? And the, and the second demand is uh, data science. Computer science, data science. And that's really more leaning towards statistics, statistical algorithms. Um, what is it that the customer wants to buy? What is it I should sell them? How should I present my product? Where are my risks, et cetera? The amount of demand for data science and computer science has just exploded. And partly it's exploding because most of these enterprises, they're, they're no longer satisfied to build an application. Like it used to be, oh, I've got six projects, and I'm going to hire 10 people on each of the six projects, and we're going to work on that for three to six months. Now, the rage is federated analytics and federated application development. And by that, it means, it means I'm an insurance company. I want to put in place all of my standard securitized customer data, and I want to hire 500 developers in 27 different departments, and I want them all to work on 37 or 192 different things at the same time, and I want to hire 500 analysts who are data scientists, and I want them all to work on a different thing every day. And so you're seeing a thousand people that are launching 500 projects on top of enterprise resources at the same time as fast as they can. And, uh, and this is a, it's a trend you see in retail, you see in banking, you see in government, you see in media, uh, just about every industry. And so it used to be, you know, when I was at MIT, we numbered the courses. They were like zero, 1 through 21, right? And I had a degree in 16, that's aeronautical engineering, and 21 was, was humanities and engineering. Um, and I thought, well, you know, I've got 1 out of 20 degrees. But it turns out that now the computer science area is becoming half of all the degrees, and the data science is exploding. So as the world dematerializes, you know, the, the number of, well, let's take uh, conventional science, conventional math. Isaac Newton invents calculus, what is 1776 or something? You know, and it used to be that was a challenge, a hurdle we had to get over. We have to master calculus. You don't really need that many people to master calculus anymore. You've got a calculus engine. You just plug the engine in. And so we're, we're automating out basic science and basic techniques like that. Uh, on the other hand, there's some things you can't automate out yet. We haven't figured out how to automate out the creation of new software. And we haven't figured out how to automate out the, st the statistical risk analysis. So, so what should I do and why should I do it? That's, you know, if I was giving advice to a, you know, an 18-year-old today and they said, should I study statistics or should I study calculus? I would say, study statistics, study, study risk and probability uh, because you're going to need that in so many different areas. And, uh, you know, so what do we do? Um, and what, are, what do all these customers do? If you want to build applications, you're building two types of applications, applications that extract insight, that help you make a better decision, and then applications that let you take action. Right? This is a, it's, a, it's an old theme, you know, MicroStrat, uh, sorry, MIT's coat of arms, it says uh, men and manas, Latin for mind and hand, and they've got a scholar and they've got a blacksmith on their shield, right? And so that goes back a long time the general idea is I need to be able to think and I need to be able to do. Well, that's not any different today in the digital economy. People want to think, what, what should I do? And then how do I do it? Now, if I, can, uh, if I can extract the five items you're about to buy or you want to buy, that's analytically interesting. There's a big, that's this field of data science. But on the other hand, if I deliver them to a propeller head analyst at the end of the month, I'm just a critic. I just explained why everything's screwed up and why you're losing money and going out of business in a very articulate fashion. I need to put the five things you want to buy in the palm of your hand when you're about to buy the sixth thing in order to monetize one of the first five things, right? Amazon does that well. Facebook does that well. 
you could argue they do it too well. If you take uh, YouTube, you know, if you, if you decide you want to study videos on, on um, how to do weightlifting while intermittent fasting, you know, and sleeping four hours a night, YouTube will serve you up 1,900 of these videos, right? It's like, and you would think the world consists of, you know, intermittent fasters that are weightlifters that have opinions about whatever ketogenic diets, and that's all you'll get. I, you know, I, I started watching chess matches online, and YouTube serves me up every chess match in the history of the world with a running commentary, each one 20 minutes long, I could sit and spend the next 2,000 hours watching chess commentary on YouTube, right? We've, uh, we live in a world of plenty, and, uh, and there's too much of everything, right? Netflix is ge generating infinite million hours of video. Uh, we've got, you know, I, sometimes I row on a rowing machine, right? And you ever row on, a, on an erg machine and it tells you how many watts you're actually rowing. And if you can get to 200 watts, you're quite the athlete. And that means if you do it for an hour, that's 200 kilowatt hour, or 200 watt hours. That means if you did it for a day, that's a kilowatt. So if anybody in the room sat and generated all the energy they could in a day, that's a kilowatt. A kilowatt's 12 cents, you know? And there are people, 12 cents. The value of all your energy is, is a penny an hour, maybe. And by the way, there are people talking about solar energy that's going to drive that to a couple of cents. You know, and so 100,000 years ago, right, we didn't have enough energy, right? You spent your entire day running around today. If you're the fryer later boy in a McDonald's, you have nine dollars an hour which means you have more energy at your disposal than Augustus Caesar right the most powerful person on the earth 2,000 years ago in fact you know like I you know used to be 20 horses 20 horses seems like a lot right if you ride a horse but like it's nothing now so we have infinite energy we have infinite mechanical energy we have infinite entertainment energy nine bucks gets you 40 million songs what which songs you're gonna listen to right Nine dollars gets you a million hours of Netflix. Zero dollars gets you a million hours of YouTube. You know, the, there's a guy in Croatia and he basically sits on his computer and he uh, creates commentary of chess games for a living and he has a, a chess channel and he's got, I don't know, every time he posts he gets like 75,000 people watching his television show. He makes a living giving a commentary of chess games, right? Like, it's an explosion in stuff. Now, um, what, is that, what does that mean for a business? Well, uh, when we hire people, uh, we want people that can code or, or create content. That's one thing. Uh, the second thing we want is we want people that can uh, QA it or test it. So we want people that know how to break it. And it takes a lot of creativity to break things. Uh, the third thing is we want uh, people that can market it. Marketing is like, it's an you know, amazing thing. You know, when I grew up, if someone called you sugar, that was a compliment. And if someone called you fat, that was uh, an insult. And it turns out today in the world of modern organic nutrition, we now understand that sugar is not really good for you. It's toxic. And fat is actually pretty healthy for you. And so marketers at some point figured out how to make a good thing bad and a bad thing good, and uh, they're still doing it today, right? In fact, uh, it's more important than ever to be able to market things. So how do you communicate uh, to people? Uh, every single company on the face of the earth struggles with this issue because there are so many choices, right? I mean, all these people are creating this content. It's like, now, how am I going to market it to you? How do I? And by the way, marketing, when I'm marketing to a, a, a consumer, right, is traditional marketing. But then you get to the next challenge, which is, um, which is uh, regulatory compliance. Um, how do you convince the governments to support this thing? So the politics of it. And politics are becoming more important everywhere. Uh, regulatory drivers, right? Well, for example, it's, uh, it's as of two weeks ago, it's legal to gamble 
Four weeks ago, it wasn't legal to gamble except in certain places, right? The Supreme Court just made a pretty momentous decision. Um, it's going to change, you know, the lives of, of, if not hundreds of thousands, millions of people. And we're going to see probably these programs where you can sit and watch a hockey game and you can bet on whether the power play is going to score or not score on your iPhone, right? Depending on what state you're in and how it works. Um, politics is pretty critical, right? For example, um, <laughs> let's take Uber. Uber's a good idea, and, and people think, uh, they'll say, well, that was a good idea. I wish I had that idea. Well, the truth of the matter is lots of people had that idea, right? Actually, having the idea was the easiest thing. Other people think, well, the secret to Uber is they could create the software. Well, not really. Creating the software wasn't the challenge either. Lots of people created software that worked. What makes Uber Uber? Well, they were able to raise $25 billion, okay? That actually is pretty interesting. How do you actually convince or persuade people to give you money, right? The world is awash in money. There's, there's so much capital out there. I think there's uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars looking for any idea. So one of the challenges, how do you persuade someone to give you the money? After that, then Uber's big because they decided they would spend it all, right? And, and that's interesting, just raw aggression. If you're willing to actually spend $20 billion and then waste another billion dollars every 12 weeks, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, because they're basically still giving away a billion dollars of subsidies every quarter. Well, it's interesting because number one, someone made a decision, they'll just go ahead and spend a billion more than they're, they're making. And number two, they, um, they made the decision that they'll be able to raise more money and they seem to be doing fine, right? Uh, the world's being changed by people making those risks. Now, the last piece that's interesting is that Uber happens to be breaking the law in half the jurisdictions they do business in, right? And that, that's very curious and getting away with it, okay? Now, you know, once upon a time we had online poker and, you know, and that was kind of illegal and, and, and it was interesting and popular until the Fed started dragging the executives running these websites off of their planes at Dulles Airport and jailing them. And so is Uber, is Uber going to continue or not continue? And the district attorney of New York could change the, you know, the, the trajectory of that entire business in a heartbeat, or maybe, you know, in Miami, it happens to be illegal some places. There's 18 different municipalities in Miami, 18 different mayors, 18 different police forces. There are not hundreds, but thousands, if not tens of thousands of interesting municipalities. So when you think about marketing, we're not just marketing to convince you to trust our Uber application and get in our car. We're marketing to persuade tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of powerful actors to allow us to make that service available, right? Airbnb is in the same boat, by the way. It's illegal to rent an apartment in Miami Beach, and yet Airbnb has got a thriving business renting apartments, right? Now, politically, like, how do I feel about that? Well, I'm not sure how I feel about it, but what I'm sure of is if you're in business today, you have to be able to persuade people of your point of view, and sometimes it's persuade consumers, sometimes it's persuade people to drive for you, sometimes it's persuade regulators not to jail you, sometimes, you know, like a classic example, right, is uh, when, I was in, uh, when I was in college, we didn't, have, uh, we didn't have access to so much medicine and there was no such thing as Adderall, okay? And so, interestingly enough, you know, I went to MIT and I had, uh, I had stress, right? It's, it's difficult getting through college with people that seem to be smarter than you, that are better prepared than you, you know? So one week I thought I had a nervous breakdown and I didn't want to get out of bed and, and the response was not to give me medical care. Uh, the response was someone, an um, upperclassman came and he shook the bed and said, get out of bed and go back to work, you know, you'll be fine. And so someone kicked me and I went back to work. But uh, somewhere between now and then, the Shire Corporation invented Adderall. Adderall is, is uh, you know, 
there's, we, there's no need for it except if you have a hard time concentrating. By the way, I still have a hard time concentrating, <laughs> okay? <laughs> right. I don't, you know, like, how many people in the world have a hard time concentrating? That's like the human condition. So we invent a disease, you know, called the temp attention deficit. We invent a drug, we patent a drug, and then we sell the drug, and then we, uh, well, nobody wants to buy the drug, so we market the disease, but then, you know, then we sell it to some people, but a lot of people in the middle class can't afford the drug, and the lower class can't afford the drug, because it costs $10 a day. If I want to sell you a $400 a month drug, I need to find a way to subsidize it. So, you know, the great marketing here is, I make it legal, I roll out a universal entitlement to free health care. I then give you access to doctors, then I co-opt the doctors, then I prescribe the drug, then I give you the money from the taxpayers to buy the drug, and then I convince your parents that if you have a hard time concentrating at age six, you probably need a drug. The, mo the result today is 14 million Americans have a prescription to Adderall, and the Shire Corporation just sold for $64 billion to Takeda. Um, and four million kids have a prescription to Adderall. And they didn't even make that decision. They just got diagnosed as having a hard time concentrating. And, and of course, when I was growing up, every kid had a hard time concentrating. I was, the, I was the most successful person in my school. I was voted most likely to succeed. And I was universal, and, and I was considered of one characteristic, which I was really good at concentrating. But I can't concentrate. So the summary here is very interesting, which is, if you can market stuff, you can actually convince people to buy it, you convince governments to make it legal, you can get a patent on it, you can even convince the government to subsidize it, and then you can turn the medical establishment and the university establishment and maybe even convince the parents of junior that they should actually give it to their kid, you right? I grew up in a world where uh, a day without orange juice is like a day without sunshine, okay? Orange juice is like pure sugar but I grew up thinking orange juice was healthy, and not only was it healthy, it was very important for me to drink it. It's classic marketing. So, um, you know, there's a lot of interesting political uh, implications of that, but here's the most important thing from a credentialing point of view. So uh, we need people in business that can build things, can, uh, can assess uh, the effectiveness of things, can market the things, and then we get to finance and legal and work on the finance and legal aspects. Uh, you know, uh, if you look at the biggest, uh, the biggest retailer, Amazon, you know, they're currently shopping for, you know, Headquarters 2 or HQ2 or something like that. I think there's a 75% likelihood they'll come to D.C. here, even though it's only three of 20 different choices. But it's pretty obvious that if you're going to uh, sell anything or get in their business, they're going to need the support of the FAA, the FDIC, the FTC, the SEC, fill in the blank, just about every regulatory agency. And if, they won't just need them to do business in the U.S., but uh, they're going to need them because, let's take GDPR. The GDPR didn't come out of the U.S. GDPR came out of the EU. So at some point, the Europeans or the Chinese are going to actually slap regulations on these businesses. And when they do, they'll need the State Department and Foggy Bottom in order to uh, protect them. And so, uh, you know, the logical thing to do is drop a few billion dollars on Washington, D.C. as an insurance policy. Right? I'm, I'm always flabbergasted, right? People write these stories about big companies lobbying and they go like, well, they're spending 15 million a year lobbying, like that's a lot of money. If you had $600 billion at stake, 15 million is not a lot of money, right? 15 million is nothing, right? It's like, it's a rounding error. If you had $600 billion at stake, you would think that you would drop $6 billion as an insurance policy. So I, I, I think that uh, it's pretty clear DC is gonna be the most powerful city in the world in the 21st century. It is this center of empire, and, and one of the reasons why is because English is now the predominant language, the U.S. law is the, is the primary law, the banking system, the dollar is the primary currency. Uh, all of these things are creating massive liquidity, and, uh, and they're driving this digital transformation. And 
there's just a couple of regulators in DC that could decide that this cool trick I just did with my watch makes Apple a bank. And if Apple is a bank, that changes the entire dynamic of what the Apple Computer Corporation can do. And when Amazon ships you your bottle of Adderall, does that make them a medical provider? And are they on the hook for the misuse or the use of that or not, right? I mean, because it's a very fine line be between being a $64 billion public pharmaceutical company and being a drug dealer. It's a very fine line, right? And that, and, by, and that line gets drawn here in the city, actually. And it gets redrawn every day. You know, as of a month ago, the view was it's illegal to gamble, right? It's illegal to have a law. New Jersey can't have a law that makes gambling illegal. And then two weeks ago, that changed, right? It's a very fine line. They throw you in jail on one side of the line. The other side of the line is just an entrepreneurial opportunity. Um, now I'm getting to the, to the meat of the matter, credentials. Well, we, we live in a, uh, a world where we're digitizing everything, so we need digital skills. Uh, the skills are evolving rapidly. You hire people today that know data science. We want them to know R and Python. Um, we don't need them to know the calculus of variations, right? We need them to know R and Python. Uh, you know, it used to be if you knew facts, that was really cool. We'd sit around and we're like, well, you know, in 1976, somebody did something or other. Now, I sit with like 20-somethings and I'll start talking about stuff that happened in the 1980s. And as I'm talking, they're like typing on their phone. They're like, well, actually, no, that was 1975. <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, I think that such and such batted 294. Like, no, actually, they batted 287. Uh, you know, and knowing anything is now not that valuable because your teenager can, like, know it better than you can know it, you know, just playing with their phone. It's very irksome, right? It's very irksome, right? Sometimes we play a game. Just type any question into, into the Google, right? And the Google gives you the answer. You're like, I don't recollect it like that. You know, you could, now here's an interesting point, right? You could have a PhD in fill in the blank history, you know? But a 16 year old with the phone has probably got a better recollection than the PhD in history uh, because the 16 year old with the phone is tapping into the Google, which is actually pulling the statistically proper answer based upon 97,000 other PhDs opinions. And so the market is just awesomely, frighteningly powerful. And some things matter, and some things, just, they, become, they decay. There's a half-life on this. So certain things we want, and you know, we want those, that talent to be fresh. So our credentials, are they transparent? Are they precise? And are they uh, relevant, or are they stale? So we, <coughs> we hire, I guess, 1,000 people a year. So I, and, I, and we try to do smart recruiting. We've actually got a product called Smart Recruiters that does it. And uh, I actually approve every single person we hire in the company. And I do it uh, from my phone here. And, uh, you know, and uh, when we do it, I don't have time to interview everybody, but we must interview 10,000 people a year, right? We probably sift through 10 to 20,000. And so, uh, it used to be I would, uh, I would interview 30 a day or 25 a day, and that's like a heroic thing. But, but uh, you know, you, know <clears throat> you don't win wars by dying for your country. You win wars by making the other person die for their country. And nor are you successful in business by working hard. You're successful in business by making other people work hard for you or making systems work hard for you. So uh, that heroic idea of working really hard got replaced with a new idea, which is we actually apply uh, diagnostics. We call them A, B, C, D, E. Uh, we give people an analytics diagnostic, an A rating, and we score them from 0 to 100. And it's like the math version of the SAT. And then we uh, give them a B rating, which is business diagnostic. <clears throat> and um, we score that from 0 to 100. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the business diagnostic is, you know, do you understand how to get along with other educated adults and persuade them of something? 
right? And so we're testing to see whether or not you can sell anything or whether or not you can uh, persuade someone of something. Then we have a C diagnostic, it's coding, and we check to see if you can write code. And uh, obviously not everyone needs to write code, but if you do need to write code, we give you the diagnostic. And then we have a D diagnostic, it's design. And uh, in our case, we check to see whether you know how to actually create a software design that displays information in a clear fashion. You know, there's a way uh, to put information in front of someone that's uh, very elegant, concise, succinct, transparent. And there's another way to put information in front of people that's jumbled, confusing, noisy, ambiguous. And uh, we want to see whether or not you tend toward the better or the worse way. And uh, the, e, the E diagnostic is English, okay? Can you actually master the English language? Now, there's a, we don't have a, a, a universal set of credentials that we can go to uh, from third parties that we can tap into, but there's nothing particularly unique about these five diagnostics. And I would say, uh, just about anybody in the digital economy trying to find people that could, uh, that could create any kind of uh, application would want to do the same thing. So I would guess that whereas we interview 10,000 people a year, probably this is relevant to 100 million to a billion interviews a year. Um, we do it ourselves uh, because it's better than not doing it and it takes like half an hour per diagnostic. So if you would put 10,000 people through it, it's 10,000 times two and a half or 25,000 hours of testing. Now the result is uh, we get complete uh, liquid transparency. So when someone wants to hire someone, we want to hire a such and such in Shanghai or a software engineer in Warsaw, I'll glance at my phone and I'll look at, everybody's got a resume and they've all got something, right? Everybody writes something and now you can't really be sure of the something. There's 10,000 institutions. I don't know any of these institutions. And certainly I can't form an opinion. I just look at the diagnostics and in one second I can, I can uh, take the measure of how well they'll fit. Now it's not 100% perfect, it's like, it's like, but it's an 80% <clears throat> match. I can get to an 80% conclusion in one second. And yesterday I rejected some, uh, one person I never met in my entire life. Bang, you're like, and I rejected it from six levels up because they were uh, fairly average or mediocre in their analytical skills. And I thought it, there's no point in us hiring an entry level consultant that was mediocre in that, in that uh, world. Um, might as well move on to the next one, because, and, and why? Well, I can see the stream of the 100 people we previously hired from the same jurisdiction, and they're all maxing out, right? In fact, I can, I can uh, see uh, exactly what they're gonna be able to do and how fast they're gonna be able to do it, and, and it helps us to figure out what kind of roles to put them in. Um, I, I can't help but think that uh, we're on a cusp of uh, an explosion in, uh, in credentialing because at the point that you actually create a public credential, and there's nothing secret here, right? Like public coding, uh, you know, public data science. By the way, A, B, C, D, E is the basic. You know, we've also got an F and a G. You know what F is? French. Because if you're in France trying to sell the French, you need to speak French. <clears throat> but I'll tell you another secret. If you speak English, someone that lives in Paris that chatters to you in French sounds like they speak French well. But that doesn't mean they speak French well, right? You can't tell the difference between someone that's nearly illiterate in French, in French versus someone that's actually extremely erudite in French. So we evaluate people in French and German and, and Mandarin, you know, in the major languages and Portuguese and Italian. Now here's an interesting idea. Wouldn't you think that the Italian government has a vested interest in being able to certify that you speak Italian? Right? I mean, wouldn't they be the number one beneficiary of that? Um, so if you're looking at technologies, right, we've got We've got infinite cloud power. We've got infinite mobile power. We've got new technologies like blockchain. 
uh, that allow you uh, to upload a distributed ledger uh, that's not, that you can't tamper with, right? And, and everybody's trying to make that work for Bitcoin, right? It's like, can you actually <clears throat> distribute uh, decentralized money that you can't tamper with? But, but you know, credentials are like money. Like, uh, if, if you're a doctor, you know, can you scuba dive? By the way, when there's 20 people on my boat and I'm about to take them scuba diving, mean, there's massive risk and liability to me if they can't scuba dive. I don't want them to die when they're underneath the surf. So as soon as you go to that uh, digital credential, you can evaluate and certify someone in less than a second. By the way, we have, um, we have a product at MicroStrategy, and we issue uh, digital credentials uh, to the enterprise. So we'll plug into the enterprise. It's like if you're an employee, that's a credential. If you're a vendor, that's a credential. If you're an IT administrator, that's a credential. Um, if you're qualified to move a million dollars around, that's a credential. So we issue these credentials, put them on a phone, then we turn them into transponders. So if I issue you all a credential, uh, I can then take my phone out and I can scan the room and in 500 milliseconds, I can count the number of people that are Italian speakers or are scuba instructors or are registered nurses or, you know, fill in the blank, right? Who, who have mastered analytics, right? Who can, who can um, design something. So, The 20th century world is I show up with a resume and it takes six hours of interviews in order to assess whether the person is a good fit. And you know what? We're wrong half the time. 50% of the time, like, like I reject people all the time based upon, oh, they got a great resume and uh, they interview well. Okay, I'm, I'll lay out an interesting statistical observation, right? Where, uh, where the apparent is the opposite of the actual. <clears throat> if I'm not good at my job, for example, if I was incapable of uh, building software, but I went to a good school and I interview well, I'm actually more likely to be looking for a job all the time. <clears throat> so it's an example where, where <clears throat> The person standing in front of you that interviews well, of course they interview well because they interview a lot. And they have a good, <laughs> right? And they, and they have a good resume because they had to dust it off because their resume goes with the interview. And, um, you know, and then people come and they're like, well, we need to hire this person because, you know, they're like this cloud expert out of Amazon. And then I look at the assessment, I'm like, well, it looks like they're enumerate, like they, they haven't mastered English and they can't add. And so they don't seem that bright. They're like, oh yeah, but you know, they had this experience at IBM and Amazon. I'm like, well, show me the resume. Well, you know, they got there for a year and they got pushed out and they got there for a year and they got pushed out. The reason they have that great experience is because every other institution pushed them out because after they got in, they couldn't do the job. And so the interview is not a good uh, representation of what you can do. I mean. Everybody's biased, and uh, the resume doesn't really help that much either. And, and here's the other thing, right? Like, uh, the institution doesn't help that much because this is like cl classic real estate problem, you know? Um, if I have a good house and it's priced fairly, it will sell in five days. If I have a crappy house that's priced fairly, it will stay on the market for three years. And if I have a good house that's priced to double the fair price, it will stay on the market for a long time. So if you look at a thousand listings, ask the question, how many listings statistically are actually a good house at a fair price? You know, the non-statistician thinks, oh, I looked at five houses and I picked the best of the five and I made a good decision. Well, actually, but the statistician says, well, statistically, no more than five out of 1,000 listings are actually a good house at a reasonable price because a crappy product at a bad price is going to sit on the market 100 times longer. And so the statistical weighting of bad product in front of your face is going to be 99% garbage and 1% good. 
Uh, and yet a non-statistician tends to think, hey, I found the best 1%. Well, the best 1% means that you actually found just something, right? So having, that's why statistics is so important. And that's why credentials are so important. When you, when you um, get to uh, true liquidity and credentials, and I, what we're doing is, is not the most efficient thing, right? We're wasting thousands and thousands of hours testing people. When you get to um, true liqui liquid credentials, you get to uh, a network effect. And uh, instead of taking six hours to make a decision, by the way, it's, it's six hours, and if, if I live in DC and I'm trying to hire someone in Warsaw, you're talking about spending 5000 to $10,000 in order to make a decision that takes about six weeks that's only 50% accurate. So when I get to liquid credentials, right, at, at MicroStrategy, our strategy is, well, we've reduced that down to the point where instead of taking $5,000 in six weeks, maybe we can reduce it to like one week and $500. But at the point that the Italian government issues an I rating that tells you whether to speak Italian, then someone shows up and instead of taking 30 seconds to apply for the job, or 30 minutes to apply for that job, they take 30 seconds. A lot of people, by the way, they don't want to apply for a job if it takes them two and a half hours to apply, right? Or three hours, they get turned off by that. So in a world where it takes 10,000 people three hours each, that's 30,000 hours of impedance. What happened if we just put those credentials in the public domain Right, and, and uh, the University of Europe, right? There's, there's no national jurisdiction on, on uh, being able to think clearly, right? Uh, it could be, and by the way, a billion people speak English, so we could issue a standard credential to all billion people. So if, if you actually start to put a, an array of standard credentials out there, and I think that probably 24 to 36 credentials would probably cover 80% of all the hiring. So it's not that many. You put an array out there, then someone who's looking for a job could take those credentials, post those credentials on the network, and instead of applying to, by the way, and this doesn't help my company at all, right? It makes it harder for us. Instead of applying to uh, six companies in order to get a job, I could actually post my credentials online and apply to 600,000 companies simultaneously to get a job, right? And so we'll actually end up with a, a very different liquidity. What if, what if you're just a smart person living in Dubai right now and you wanted to apply to every company in America at the same time, right? Well, as long as they're heterogeneous in their approach, can't do it. But uh, at the point that you have a common set of credentials, you can. So we talk about currency. The dollar is 83% of all the trades. It's a common currency. English is a common language. TCPIP is a common networking protocol. The rise of certificates for TCPIP you know, uh, has uh, resulted in a worldwide web and a network. I, I think that uh, we, are, we are still in early days with regard to creating uh, liquidity of human talent. But uh, all the technologies are there, all the motives are there. There are any number of organizations that have an incentive to do this. So when I, you know, when I t uh, you know, talk about the Sailor Academy, I say, you know, that the easiest thing was creating the courseware. Not that it's easy, but it's the first thing, create the content. The harder thing is to market it. Even if it's something for free, it's hard to give it away. Uh, and then the hardest thing is to work through the politics of it, you know, and the accreditation. But uh, that's where I think you guys are all doing great work and we can all do this together. If we can start to just break this down bit by bit, and it might be a win at the state level, it might be a win at the federal level, it might be something as simple as getting a, you know, national scuba diving you know, credential uploaded. As we start to see those liquid credentials come online, I think there'll be an avalanche and it'll be bit by bit, we'll break this down. And, and when we get to the point where you can uh, uh, acquire your credentials electronically and then post them electronically, 
that's going to create the greatest opportunity for humans in the history of the world. Because at that point, anybody, anywhere can apply for, not anything, can apply for everything. And you're going to have, you know, f for me, I'll take my little company, I would hire 1,000 people in the next 48 hours all around the world if they can hit our credential requirements, right? We have, we have that much demand. Companies like Google, Facebook, the rest, they hire 100,000 instantly if they can find the right people. They might hire a million people instantly. So there's a massive opportunity to, to spread jobs, spread wealth, uh, spread prosperity if we can break down the barriers and the impedance and the restraints uh, to that progress. And I think uh, we're all working together to do that here today. And so I, I want to thank everybody in the room that's actually made investments in credentials and is working on either the technology or the marketing or the politics or the legal aspects of them because they're all important. And uh, hopefully we can do good things together in the coming year.